Welcome to Moderna Museet. It's a true pleasure to see you all here. Fantastic. And we have our guests of honor waiting outside. And they are, of course, two persons, one artist, Gilbert and George. And they will sit here and have a discussion together with Hans Ulrich Obrist, who is one of the curators of the show, which you're going to see in a while. Uh, and I'm very happy to stand in front of you just to introduce you to this and I will just hand over the microphone to uh, Ulf Eriksson, a colleague of mine, who will give you some practical information and then we have Hans Ulrich Orbis, artistic director of Serpentine, among many other things, together with the artist Gibbet and George. So, please Ulf. <coughs> Thank you very much, Anne Sophie. Uh, my name is Ulf Eriksson, and I'm a curator at the Learning Department here at the Moderna Museet. I'm very happy to see so many of you here tonight for this uh, afternoon's program, uh, Gilbert and George in conversation with Hans Ulrich Obrist. Uh, the exhibition will open for the public tomorrow, but we are very happy to be able to give you an opportunity to a sneak peek even tonight. So after the talk, uh, you are welcome up in the exhibition, and it will be open until 7.30 tonight. Uh, this conversation will be documented and published on the Modern Museet YouTube channel, so uh, please make sure to subscribe and you will get an update when it's published. Uh, without further ado, now I would like to give a warm welcome to Gilbert and George and Hans Ulrich Orbitz. Good evening and thank you so much for these warm words of uh, introduction. And before we start, I wanted to ask you all to give another very warm welcome to Gilbert and George. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, all my thanks also to Daniel Birnbaum, with whom we've curated this exhibition over the last couple of years and also to Maya Hoffman and the Luma Foundation, where the exhibition uh, initiated in Arles, in the south of France. And it's an exhibition which has literally only just begun. It's very exciting that it begins today here in Stockholm. The show will then continue also in Reykjavik and in Oslo. There is a separate exhibition also happening in Finland, and uh, that is just the beginning of this very, very long tour. From the very beginning, when we discussed uh, with Daniel uh, and the different museums how to actually structure this exhibition, Gibran George uh, suggested this idea that we would really go decade by decade because there are so many amazing work in every decade. And so I thought today for the conversation we could somehow make it a journey through time. And I wanted to begin with the very first question really how it all began, how you came to art, how art came to you, and if you can tell us a little bit about your first works, because you told us that these first works were actually exhibitions, that there were exhibitions like a very special project in Frank's Sandwich Bar in London. It would be great to hear about your beginnings. Very good. I think it all starts off when two boys from the country end up at the art school, St. Martin's School of Art, in London in 1967. It was the age when everyone said we were living in the permissive society. It was a time of swinging London and anything goes and free love. But we weren't part of that at all because we were well-behaved country, lower class people. We weren't the middle class students who were going crazy with drugs and, drugs and drink and rock and roll and sex. We were very well behaved and we wanted very much to succeed. It was quite exciting because 
After all, I come from the mountains, so I started, I always wanted to be an artist. I remember when I was seven years old, I wanted to be an artist. So when I was 14 years old, I went to the first art school for three years that was in the Dolomites. And then the, the vicar told me I should go to Austria to progress my idea of art. So I went to Hallein for one year. And that didn't work. It felt I couldn't go anywhere. So I had this idea of Munich. Oh, Munich is very exciting. So I went there, I stayed six years in the Academy of Art. And even that I realized I was not becoming an artist. So I, I saw this extraordinary exhibition of English art in a gallery in Munich. It was Heiner Friedrich Gallery. And that I had a vision to work toward what to go to London. And when I went to London, for me, it felt like going to the moon. You know? <laughs> and it was extraordinary. And by accident, I managed to get into the school that was the most famous art school in the world at that time, St. Martin School of Art. <coughs> and who did I meet there? George. <laughs> <laughs> it's just very simple because our generation, we are both war babies. We came, came out of the Second World War and I grew up with everyone around us, the family and friends, only knew one thing, things will get better. And they did. It was extraordinary. We do believe even today that the world is an extraordinary privileged triumph. It's never before have so many people had so much opportunity and, and so many advantages. It's an enormous success. And our world, the Western world, the world of Europe, North America, Australasia, a few, a few outposts as well, is the real success. And we believe that success is a cultural one. It's not because of the police station, it's not because of the church, it is because of all of the music our grandparents did or did not listen to, the books our grandparents did or did not read. We are a cultural success. And we know that because if we go outside of that world, we will not be safe and we won't be free. So culture has made us safe and free. It's an enormous triumph. And when some of our younger friends grumble about life or events, we say that's extremely ungrateful. You just have to remember all of those people who worked so hard and died and went to prison and got executed in order to arrange this amazing utopian existence. And of course, the one thing that is always true is there is room for improvement. And, and we're all working on that. Thank you so much. And actually, <laughs> one thing which is important because you talked about this time, you know, at college, but then when you actually left college, there was this epiphany of you basically deciding that you were one artist. And uh, you told me uh, and Daniel in this conversation, we did a very long conversation for the catalog. Um, you told us there that it was all about being artists without the usual arrangements. It was quite exciting because in 1967, 68, we had to leave all the art school. No, it was the end of the line to be happy art students. So we ended up in the streets of London with not a studio and just wanted to be art and nothing, wanted to be an artist and nothing else. So we had this amazing vision ourselves that walking the streets of London, we could be the art. No? And it was a revolution and we are still the same. We put on our responsibility suits of our art and forever we are the mad vicars. <laughs> So it's, we always think it's, a, it's something that we didn't think of or decide or talk about. It's something that came over us, like a change in the weather, changes the mood. So in some ways, it's like a, like a pantomime or a, a folk story of two country boys in, in this amazing London town without any money and no studio and wandering the streets of London and being amazed by the tube stations and the railway stations, and the police stations, and the palaces, and the department stores, and the hotels, and the shops, and the markets, and the streets, and the river with the boats, and the parliament, and all, all this amazing world. And we loved it. We realized that we had to become part of 
the urban life. We didn't want to go back to the idea of the country. We felt that somehow or other we had to become urban artists. And I think at the very, very beginning, most of our pictures are involved a little bit with nature because we couldn't get the nature out from inside of ourselves. Only in maybe with the red morning pictures and then with the dirty words pictures, we became real modern city artists. And, and then one day we made maybe a slight mistake because we'd forgotten about what we'd escaped from. And a friend invited us down to the country, to a small village in North Devon. And so we went down to see him and we got up the next morning because it was so quiet. We, we were always woken up by the silence. And we walked up this little lonely high street with the estuary at the bottom and these beautiful birds swooping down. And you could hear, it was so quiet, you would hear the insects in the hedgerows. And, and we passed the early morning postman and it all seemed so idyllic and so beautiful. Nature, so peaceful. It reminded me of our school hymn, Here in the country's heart, with the grass is green. green, life is the same sweet life as it e'er has been. And we came to the top of the village, and there was the medieval parish church, built in the 12th century and then added to a very beautiful Gothic building, with the tombstones and the flowers and the weeds. And in front of the gates of the churchyard, to perf make the perfect scene, there was a young couple, a boy and a girl, with a pram, with a sleeping baby. And we were almost in tears at this perfection of utopian country beauty. And we said to the young couple, good morning. And the young man turned to us and said, fuck off, you weird looking cunts. <laughs> <laughs> and and then, then we knew that we had to stay in the city. We had to stay in the city. <laughs> Back to the city. We haven't been, we haven't been back since. <laughs> <laughs> and to go back to the city, I wanted to ask you about the, the kind of first gallery show, the first exhibition. And one of the only words I know in Swedish is good year. I think it means Merry Christmas. And it's very interesting that actually your first gallery show was a Christmas show in 1968 in Robert Fraser's gallery and I always think it's interesting to hear about the first show artists do. Can you tell us about it? It was quite show? exciting because at that time was a, the period of experiment. We are trying to find a good way how to become really artists. But I think the most important part of our life was when we discover the record underneath the arches. Yes, when these two country boys were wandering in London as I was saying and we came across the tube station and the railway station of, of Houston. And then behind Houston, we found a utopian housing estate from the early 20th century with white stucco and gaily painted front doors. And in, in front of the flats, there were gardens with flower beds. And there were washing lines for hanging out washing. And they had washing poles, wooden poles, to support the washing lines. And on the top of the poles, there were huge ceramic birds, a different bird on every pole. They were commissioned by the architect from Royal Dalton. Mm. So it was an amazing, dreamlike, perfect, wonderful place to live. And in front of the gardens, there were retail units. There was one with washing machines, there was a liquor store, a tobacconist and newsagent shop, and then a wonderfully mysterious shop which sold all of the things that the caretaker of the flats would give the shop when someone leaves their flat. Everyone leaves something behind when you leave your house or your flat. <clears throat> so there were some, some tatio paperback books, a saucepan with the handle rattling insecurely, <clears throat> and a, a lampshade with a hunting scene. And, and a lot of on all the detritus, the unloved, unwanted objects of existence. And amongst them, we found a gramophone record. And the title of the song was underneath the arches. And we knew what that meant because we lived in Spitalfields and we were surrounded by three huge hostels which were places for damaged men to live. Many of them were very elderly, being damaged by the First World War. More were not so old, being damaged by the Second World War or the Korean War. 
and a huge section of them had been damaged by the sex laws, which said at that time, if, if you committed some minor sex or misdemeanor, the police would say, if you're not here tomorrow morning, we can't charge you, which meant you would pack a little case, you would have to leave, you wouldn't be able to say goodbye to anyone because of the shame, and of course you only gravitate towards capital cities, so, so many of these tramps were in these huge hostels. <clears throat> and and we, th that was like underneath the arches for us. We took the record home and we found a friend who had an old wind-up gramophone player. We put the record on and we were amazed by the words because they were so much like our life was. And it's very much like our interests now in another way. And the words were, the writs I never sigh for, the Carlton they can keep. There's only one place that I know, and that is where I sleep. Underneath the arches, I dream my dreams away. Underneath the arches, on cobblestones we lay. Every night you find me, tired out and warm. Happy when the daylight comes creeping, heralding the dawn. Sleepy when it's raining, and sleepy when it's fine. La -di 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 -da, da 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 Pavement is my pillow, no matter where we rain. Underneath the arches, I dream my dreams away. And there we found art. Uh, that was the most important thing we ever did. Because after that, we became the art. Uh, we became the emotional artwork. Not like a stone, not a piece of marble, not like a piece of bronze, but human humanity took over for us in the art. And that changed the whole idea of art forever for us. We know that when we were asked you, all the art was minimal at that time. No? And we were able to make a human art for ourselves. And it was a revolution for us. We are still carrying on doing that. An art that ha has emotion and has a morality behind it. It, it gave us the moral dimension, the fire and the truth and the beauty of, and the power of culture. And we realized that we were able to deal and be active in the fields that lie inside all of us, wherever we live on the planet, whatever our educational background, whatever our religious beliefs, we would be able to deal in some way with death, hope, life, fear, sex, money, race, in the religion and shitty naked human world all of the content of mankind and its progress and and, and the success story there yet we realized that we were having this journey towards the end you know what it go like like uh, we have this book in england called pilgrim's progress no and it is not a very famous book but uh, the journey from a human person towards the end and what he finds in front of us all the time, you know, like all the devils, all the good, and all the bad, and all the stuff. And we have to fight because our art is not based on looking outside, what it is. It's all looking inside yourself, how life feels like being alive today. It's all that a vision is inside you and not outside. Outside will stay forever roughly the same. But in the, in the inner thought is full of contradiction, full of complexity, like we all are, human people. That's why when we create a picture, we always try to make it part of the past, present and future. It has to be those three elements. That's why Gilbert mentioned The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, the least read, most famous, most published book in the world, probably. <laughs> And uh, we did actually read it recently. It's quite, a, quite a very beautiful book. But we are, we are three or four hundred yards from where he is buried, and in the same cemetery, William Blake is buried, and Daniel Defoe is buried, 
Which one gets flowers? Which one alone gets flowers? Any guesses? William Blake, of course. And then very near that cemetery, another 100 yards, is the burial place of Fox, the founder of the Quakers. And very near that is the burial place of the Wesley brothers, who founded the second biggest group of Christians in the world today. We're also within walking distance of the Anglican church at the end of our street, which has, when you enter the church, there isn't a cross, there isn't a Jesus, there is a royal coat of arms to remind you when you enter that this is the Church of England, not the Church of Rome. At the other end of the street, we have the French Huguenot Church, which closed down after a while and became the synagogue. That closed down after a while and is now a mosque. We wonder what will be next. I guess. And we are in the middle there, it's the secularists. We have our they church don't in the middle. believe us, are in the middle. And we, we have the, the German church at the end of Brick Lane, and then a little bit further along the road, we have the very superior Portuguese synagogue, which is very active. On Brick Lane, there is the address, the building's not there, the address where Oscar Wilde went to smoke opium. And the whole district is named Spitalfields because it was the place for returning crusaders from the Holy Land who were damaged to come to recuperate the Spittle Fields. So we know we're surrounded by an amazing history of all kinds, and that's, that's part of our past, and will be part of our present and future. We, we like to think about it in that way. And then I visited you for the very first time as a teenager, and I came to London. It was a pilgrimage to visit you in your house in Fournier Street. We actually, you told me to read Bunyan's book, but you also... And you know, Oscar Wilde, when he was in prison, they gave him that book to read. It was the only, it, it was the only non-scriptural book he, he was allowed. And you also, at that time, so you showed me this book, there was a color test, yes. uh, which uh, you made us do, and also uh, we talked about postal sculptures, and of course, you described so beautifully the epiphany of the singing sculpture, which is so important, and all the very epiphanies, of course, art for all, and uh, very important today, we quote it every day, we need art for all. Can you tell us a little bit about where that came from, where the epiphany of art for all came I think from? it came very simply from our realization that we were surrounded by art students and art teacher who were determined to be willfully obscure in order to feel superior. So the fewer people could understand, the more big-headed and superior they felt. And we felt that, like in any other profession, you should be able to create something which can address the human person. We say if you break your leg, you know where the doctor in the hospital is. If you get mugged on the London Underground, you know where the police station is. But we are not made up just of the flesh and the skin and bone. We have a soul, and the soul has to be nurtured and cared for and developed. And we do that through reading poetry and books and cinema and going to exhibitions. There, there is a, the element of the soul. We believe in that. But it was quite exciting at the beginning because in, in 69, 69 we were experimenting in different way how to approach, to approach the public, the person. So we used to do um, uh, what called postal sculpture that we used to send out to different art, the, the art world, and because they were, we were telling the story, how we as human sculptors were posing ourselves in front of the window and drinking tea while it was snowing outside. So we were able to make an emotional human sculpture, and we sent it out, and it was extraordinary success. And after that, we started to find another way to make art. We did these big drawings that everybody seemed to love. And we realized we didn't want that. We didn't want a drawing that looked back to back. It felt like somebody else did it, the mother of Rembrandt or something like that. So <laughs> we stopped doing that. And then we found our own language that we are still using now, the negative, the image that is the negative, that's very powerful very direct and it was a new language that we invented for ourselves 
and that's what you see when you see the show tonight. You will see all that new language. And this us, the living sculptor, in the, in the middle of it, and we are projecting these feelings towards the wall, all inside, all the complexity of life that is inside. We are shooting on the walls and making make them more and more relevant for ourselves and for the audience because we only love the audience. We are not interested in art. We all want the audience to be able to understand what we are trying to do. And that everything is dedicated to the audience. But it's interesting also because there are many <coughs> more questions I have, Jan, about this <coughs> language you described. But before that, there was another epiphany in 1978 because you were involved with the art world and artists until then, but something happened all of a sudden in 1978, you, you stopped being involved in, in basically socializing in the art world. You even stopped going in 79 to the cinema. We and stopped, we stopped every, everything overnight. We, we, were, we were friends and party goers and, and drinking and part, uh, extraordinary in London, Paris, New York. We had an enormous circle of friends and we realized that we didn't want that social contact. So from that day onwards, we. We vowed not to go into people's houses, and not to go to art world parties, and not to have friends in that way. And we didn't need it. It was much better without. It was better for them. <laughs> better for them as well. But it's not so simple because I, it was very interesting. Because when we did the singing sculpture in Düsseldorf with Conrad Fischer, Rain, that we think he gave us the biggest op opportunity to be artists. And after that, he said to us. Why don't you leave something behind in, our, in my gallery? You know? And we did this three drawing called uh, Walking, Viewing and Relaxing. You know? There were three big drawings and we, we were quite excited and uh, we didn't think too much about it. And so we had a show and next day he sold them and 1,000 pounds and it was a fortune because you could buy a house for 8,000 pounds. <laughs> And after that, we got very excited about it. And so what did we do? We started to do, to do the drinking sculptures every night. <laughs> and when we, then even we did the real drinking pieces for many, many years. And we started to go out and entertain us and all the night clubs, dancing away the whole night, the full and stuff. Everything was art for us, no? The dancing, the drinking, and what became all gene suits. Responsibility suits of our art were all dancing away the night away, and we managed to do amazing shows, and we were excited. <coughs> and, and then we did something in '79. We saw. Yeah, and then we got confirmation of our art for all belief because we had one of the first shows at a, a, a gallery again in in Germany, and it was a very successful evening. We sold one or two pictures. We had to, lots of drinks and a big dinner. And it was, uh, everyone was thrilled. It was and we, right. we came into the <coughs> gallery the next day, and there was Conrad Fisher looking very grumpy and very miserable. And we asked him if he had a hangover, and he said, no, he didn't have a hangover. So we said, what's the matter? Oh, he wouldn't tell us. I said, tell us what's wrong. Why, why aren't you cheerful as usual? He said, oh, the cleaning lady, she likes your exhibition. <laughs> that was a, that's a very 70s story. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, the art world is not quite so much like that now, but I'm afraid it still is a little bit like that. We, we like that people know our art. We like that they understand. We like that they feel part of the story. We don't feel that we know something that we can tell the viewer. We don't feel we know something more than the viewer. We think we're exploring life and art together with the viewer. We feel we're walking down a, a road hand in hand with the viewer of art. We define our art as the friendship that is formed between the viewer and the picture. That's, that's where it is, that is the, the essence of our art. So, so when people know us in different, but people stop us on the street and say, say they love our art, invariably they've never seen an exhibition. We have a huge following amongst people who somehow or other reach our art through, not through exhibitions. And we're fascinated by that. And re recently, we decided to add to our slogan, Art for All, a new one. Because all of those tramps, those damaged people, have long gone. And they've been replaced, not in a similar quantity, 
but with, uh, with great similarities by a younger group of people who are drug addicted. And they are very thin, and they're very poor, and they're very miserable, and very ragged, and very dirty, and very desperate. And they're a quarter of our age, but nearer to death than we are. And we still are fascinated that they have some understanding of our art. And we are very moved by that. They know that we have one favorite who looks like a, a wonderful painting by a Spanish artist I can always forget the name of. He's very thin, has a wonderful profile, he's extraordinarily thin. And he, he came up to us the other day and said that he lo loved our art. And my mum loved your art, but she's dead now. Extraordinary. <laughs> to, to be able to have contact with people who are so, so desperate as <coughs> that. But also that many people see your work, and you know, not only through exhibitions, has of course to do with the books. And in a way, books are a very you know, important medium for you. And there's a, a book was published, of course, for the exhibition here also. The idea is always that books are very accessible. They, uh, you made sure that these catalogs are affordable for students. I've always remembered you know, when I was like 16 years old, growing up in Switzerland, you had the big exhibition at Jean-Christophe Amann's oh. Kunsthalle in Basel, and you know, the catalog was something like five Swiss francs. So I could buy it as a 16-year-old, exactly. otherwise I couldn't have bought it. And in a way, <coughs> that idea of art for all through your books, you also invented a whole, I mean, you've inspired generations of graphic designers and designers through your books, because you, you always design them yourselves. Can you tell me about that? We all started in 1969, we designed everything in invitation card. And we did a first book in 1970 when Conda, uh, no, what's the name? Caspar Koenig knocked on the door and asked us to do a little book. So we did a little book that is called Side by Side. And we had an additional 600, and it was fantastic. And after that, we did 1980, we did the first real catalog, designed every page by us. But the one that you're talking about, in 84, when the big show was in Basel, that was extraordinary, because <coughs> we asked publisher if they would be contribute or do or pay or something like that, and nobody wanted to be involved. So we took our own money and published 24,000 copies. Unheard of at that time. Yeah. 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 That is a book that is as fat as that. Mm. It was a sword. And still, even like that, we did a, what you call the, the 10 kilo one that we designed for the Tate Modern one. 10 kilos, can you imagine? <laughs> and that was an extraordinary success. 13,000 copies. Everybody walking, gripping themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I think so many people probably come to our art through seeing catalogues at friends' houses during a party or a family gathering. It's, it's extraordinary that we're able to reach out in that way. It's quite interesting because big shows, all the museums, they want you down all the time. But not the books. They work day and night, the books. And posts of work day and night. Even when we had the big shows like in London with YQ, we, what we call, we tried to arrange another system to, to involve ordinary people with poster. Last time we, uh, we, uh, we printed 5,000 posters at White Cube Gallery and we signed them or we sold 5,000 posters. And that is a revolution. That's an art show outside the ordinary art world. I like the batches, you know, we've distributed and keep distributing through the show uh, we do called Take Me Up. Yes. There's been more than a million of your batches have been distributed. We saw people wearing them here recently. <coughs> during the days we've been here. Now we before, have, yeah. They were, uh, what, what, are there eight badges or six badges? It's ba ban religion, burn that book, fellatio for all, make Kunaligas compulsory. And is it the other one, uh, fuck the planet. That's fuck the planet. planet. <laughs> <laughs> they were a great success, the badges. Now before, yeah, it's an exhibition called Take Me I'm Yours, where every artist does actually uh, an artwork for dissemination, and people can take it away. Yes. We did for the first time in '95 at the Serpentine, which was our, one of our earlier collaborations. But I wanted to come back to something you said before about the language, that you invented this language, this extraordinary language we can see here in the exhibition. And uh, in the conversation Daniel and I did with you in the catalog, you know, we discussed that moment when you invented that. And you said that you realized that you can't show a single photograph in a gallery because then you become a photographer. So in a way that led you to 
to invent this system yeah. which allows you to do very yeah. monumental works and yet at the same time very much as Marcel Duchamp said, you know, the museum should be portable. They are very portable. Can you tell us about the moment I you had this epiphany? Yeah, I think it's because we are sculptors who are creating pictures. We are not trained as picture makers. So we started, it was just black and white because the negative is black and white. It took us three years to find red and another year to find yellow. And then two years and then we used full color. So we had to find our own visual language. And that has evolved together with the meanings as our concerns change and evolve. So really our pictures as a whole are not a stylistic development, they're a human development and evolution of a life. So we're a young baby artist remembering childhood, thinking of the tramps going to college. It's the, it's the same evolution as the viewer. It's the, it's, it's the life of the artist and the life of the viewer together. But we had so many subjects. Now, when we start, when we found this, what you call the form to speak for ourselves, no? like the drinking piece, and then we went to Japan and we did the cherry blossom pieces because we were fascinated about this cherry blossom in the spring in Japan of falling down. So I remind everybody of the first, uh, the, what you call the, the soldiers who is dying. God, the soldiers who go to the front and die. And he is like a cherry blossom that falls down and he's dead. And then we did a, what we call the mental piece and then we did a red morning. We realized that London or everybody were the, the communist uh, cloud came <coughs> over us in some way. That's why we did a red morning. Then we did a, what we call, uh, uh, what we the dirty words piece. The dirty words piece, but yeah. strong, nothing. And then we did the cosmological piece, and new democratic picture, naked shit pictures, jack freak pictures, uh, scapegoating pictures, beard pictures, uh, what about Christian pictures? Remember? So there's all these subjects that are inside that we are struggle in some way, and we want to shoot out towards the public. But so even if you realize it's a very modern form, when you, should, when you see the show, it is a language that is like you walk into a big shop in some way. It's not like all a language of art when you see all the time colors rubbed into on, a, on the canvas more and more. It's modern, it's a new way of speaking. And something also happened which one can see here in the show very clearly is that at a certain moment you left the house. Uh, and I was friendly with this photographer, Lucia Hervé. He was in his 80s, even 90s, when I knew him in Paris. He was the photographer of Le Corbusier. And he always said, you know, Paris, uh, Paris seen from my window. So he never really left his apartment. He's for many years created this photography. And in a way, it's very fascinating because a lot of your work happened in the house and had to do with the house. And at a certain moment, as you told me, you left the house, you opened the door, and and you went. Can you tell us about what happened? That's something which leads us to the eighties. <coughs> we opened the window <laughs> and took images from the window down. That first time we, we took the first images of people from the window because we because we weren't trained as picture makers. If we were trained as picture makers, we would know how to have a, a couch and a student and to have models. But, but I, we, I think in, in in general we have a, a different system of actually making the pictures. But uh, the person, the, when we take an image of a person, they have to be a, a special person, can never be something all rich or poor, has to be in between something. Uh. I think we're not, sh we're not trying to show life or reflect life. We prefer to think that we are forming our tomorrows, that the world and the viewers will be a little bit different because of the pictures we created. Not only that, but the whole world has changed totally. From 1969 to now, it's extraordinary. Just the art world is just so big. I don't know if it's a good idea, but anyway, it's very big. It's extraordinary. <laughs> and uh, you can, uh, what you go, you can travel the world. You can phone all over the world. You can go anywhere. Yeah, even like London is a place where I don't know how many restaurants, different food, and all that. So it is like cosmology of of the world in some way. East in east end of London where we live. You just open the door, and the whole world is there. 
We don't have to go any th anywhere to be inspired. We don't want to be inspired because we want to only the, the inspiration is inside ourselves. And of course, in the 80s, so you go, you know, out of the house, first the window, and then out of the house in the 80s. It's not only that the artwork gets bigger, but your pictures suddenly become much, much bigger. And I think one of the great things in the process of working on this show was to kind of revisit also all these amazing works from the from the eighties, which uh, many of those were actually in the Basel show, which was the first show oh, yes. I, I saw. The new moral works, this gigantic group of pictures you did in the eighties. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Like drunk with God, we did one big one that is now in the, I think in Cologne Museum. It's also very important to remember that it's the art that stay, stays still and the world changes. When we did this, the Dirty Words pictures in 1977, many of our friends and supporters and champions thought that finally Gilbert and George had gone over the top, that they were being rather silly and very childish and the world doesn't need pictures like queer shit bent cunt fucked up. They thought it's completely unnecessary and really quite silly. But 25 years later, when they were gathered together, entirely together for the first time at the Serpentine Gallery, the show was an enormous success. And many of those people from the 77 who had been very against the pictures were there at the grand opening and saying, marvelous, marvelous, oh, marvelous. Oh, marvelous. Oh. <laughs> and we said, uh, thank you very much. But Surely you remember being r rather against these pictures in 1970. No, 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 I've always loved them. <laughs> because they would never remember that they'd been against. It shows that the pictures stay the same, bent, shit, cunt, all there, but the world has changed to accommodate them. That's, that's what culture does. It makes, makes room for itself. But the revolution of our of, for us became when we were able to accept the whole Darwinian idea of no God. No. That was for us extraordinary. That's why we're very interested in the, the details of religion. We've, we felt in 1980 that it, was, that it was silly to ignore religion, as a lot of modern artists felt they were superior and atheist, and uh, going to church was probably something the servants do, but they were better than that. And so we started to include religious images in our pictures. And even then, the artwork thought that was very silly, that we don't need religion, we don't need a picture with Christ in or so a church, that we're beyond that, we're sophisticated. And, and now, of course, today we know that religion is more important now, even more important now than it was then. Religious more, more, wars. More, more, more people are murdering and killing each other because of religion than, than then. Religious we wars are going on all the time, and we are. We did a lot of what all. We did these banners that were like what go, uh, ban religion in yeah. some way, and uh, that's all our art. We're quite anti-religion in a big way in some way because we don't believe we should believe in man-made religions. They're all man-made. That were much better to accept as us as human beings that we are in charge of ourselves as humans, not fake gods. Or as our favorite Indian restaurateur says, I don't believe in all these man-made gods. I'm a Muslim. <laughs> but but we, we, do believe, we, we do believe in the details, the details of religion. We have, every evening we have a, a minicab back from the restaurant we go to, and they have, they're very nice young Kurdish minicab drivers. And they're absolutely charming. We like them very much. And they, their, their delightful appearance and their delightful manner is belied entirely by their beliefs, which are incredibly horrible and offensive and disgusting. But we, we st stick with them because it's very learning, it's very, it's good to hear at first hand a prejudice of that kind. And, and they're very amusing as well. We have one called Arrow, who's very good looking, very nice, and is a friend of ours as well as a, a driver. <clears throat> one night during Ramadan, he was, he was moaning slightly about the complications of Ramadan you know, when to have a glass of water and when the next meal is because of sun up or sundown. And <clears throat> it was becoming rather a bore. So I said, so when is it over? He said, oh, uh, uh, Thursday at noon, it'll be all, uh, all over. So I said, oh, great. So then you can go back, to, go back to normal, smoking cigarettes and masturbating. He said, I don't smoke. <laughs> So 
you've seen this fun in religion as well. <laughs> now you mentioned the banos, <laughs> the famous banos, uh, and that's almost like a ritual because we, you know, we have these marathons at a certain time in London where we every year have a different theme, and then we would invite artists and architects and scientists, from, you know, practitioners from all disciplines to address that theme. And of course, the banners uh, were created for one of these marathons. Yes, it's all your idea. But the first two. We, we blame him. But what yeah, yeah. you also created for the marathon are these lists, which we um, actually uh, have here in the exhibition in the in the museum. And here, here, here we yeah, have the, the here philosophy we have, yeah. that we need. Can you tell us about? Because it's interesting, the lists. Because from the very beginning in your work, there are lists. And I mean, there's a whole literature movement uh, in the 60s. It's not a movement, actually. It's a kind of an association of poets. They never had a manifesto founded by a mathematician called Le Lyonnais, together with Georges Perec, Harry Matthews. Uh, it's called Ulipo. And uh, that's a kind of a poetry of list. And, and you have a lot of lists in, in your art. Can you tell us about, about the, your lists and these lists, particularly here in, I in Stockholm? The, I think the Focosi is the le leading one at the moment because we were thinking, we realized that everybody knows what philosophy is, even if in countries where there's never been a philosopher, we all know roughly what it means. It would be difficult for most people to describe what that form is, and maybe somebody has the odd book on philosophy in the house. We, pro we probably don't know where in our regular bookshop the philosophy section is even, and we <coughs> thought we would try to make a more accessible part of, of that area of life. So we started to, we carried cards with us day and during dinner, and every night we wrote down more to the, added to the Fakosi, until it became this, we think it's a great uh, work of literature, in fact, it's an amazing modern form, the Fakosi. And when we finished the Fakosi, we realized that there was something else to do, and that would be the Godology, which we're writing at the moment. It's already nearly, Three, seven, five thousand godologies are going on in the moment, and it was quite it was quite exciting when we had this big what you call talk at the Alexander Palace in London. No? It is a place where ordinary people came. We were amazed because they asked us to do a talk there, and there were seven hundred people there, and we did a one page of philosophy, no? just one little page. What happened there later? And, and then after the talk, we had a, a book signing, and. A hundred nice middle class educated well dressed people queued up and said things like, It's for my wife, I love her so much. Could you write fuck, 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 please? <laughs> <laughs> and nearly everyone wanted something like that. It was as though they were throwing off chains or, yes. or be, being thrilled to do something different that evening from every other evening in their life. It was just quite extraordinary. We had a small show in, in uh, what called in South of London? No, in. Where they ask us about the buttocks. Oh, in, Brighton. in Brighton, we had a small show there, and we had big, some big pictures there, like in the shit and stuff like that. And we had all, we had to entertain the audience, so all, not old, but 40 year old ladies, no? and they all wanted to be photographed in front of the naked, what they call the naked chick picture. <laughs> all the time, and wanted the buttocks in it as well. <laughs> And so that's it's, it's extraordinary revolutionary for us that you see the ordinary people are want to liberate themselves in an amazing way, that we are able to accept the more than less. I think that's important. We, lo we like the occasions when we realize we're able to prove art for all, that we're able to reach people who wouldn't normally be affected in any way by art. I remember when we did an exhibition of the naked ship pictures at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. And we went over for the opening, and uh, it was an enormous success, the opening. And uh, the next day we were free in the afternoon, so we had the chance to take a lovely stroll in the, in the sunlight of the Amsterdam. And we walked through Amsterdam, and then by chance we found ourselves walking down the street, which has these buildings which have the live sex shows. And outside each of the places there's a man telling you, trying to get you in. So we've just passed it, we heard a man say, live fucky fucky show, starts in five minutes, only four euros. Live fucky fucky show, so good morning Gilbert, good morning Gilbert, starts in ten minutes, five Gilbert. So, so we, there, so we, we made it. We got it. We, we got made it. it. <laughs> now you talked about, I brought back the art for all thing. It's interesting because Tim Berners-Lee, 
invented the World Wide Web in 1989, a world changing oh, yeah. invention. And it's, of course, you know, in a couple of weeks, it's the 30th anniversary. I think on the 13th of March, he, he, I just had a conversation with him a couple of weeks ago about it. And so it will be on the 13th of March, you know, the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web. And of course, Tim Berners Lee is very concerned about what's happening to the World Wide Web because he sees the loss, the potential loss of net neutrality because he always wanted the World Wide Web to be for everyone, and he doesn't want to have a faster internet for those who pay and a slower internet for those who can't pay. So anyway, in a way it's interesting that he talks about this is for everyone, and you talk, talk about art for all, and it brings us to the question of the digital, because one of the things which I was thinking also this afternoon, walking in the exhibition, um, a really major change in the practice in your work was the arrival of the digital, the, the computer yes. entering the studio. And I wanted to ask you to tell us how that happened and what it changed. It was very exciting because it was in 1970, 99, we realized that we could not buy the paper that we used to. It was a big company, Kodak, uh, Ilford, and they, they went bankrupt. So it was all finished. And then we realized we had to move over to a new system. Then we we start to, to what do you call to think about digitally making the pictures, but the cameras were not good enough at that time. So we realized that we could do them in what are called scanning the images you know, with drum scanner. It took half an hour each to a little a little thirty five millimeter shot was, and then we were able to invent a new language for ourselves, and we had this what do you call this art this professional people coming in to teach us how to do it and they all wanted to be involved and they all say put the coffee here and put the posters here I want a shake of air on the wall here and we're all making fantastic pictures no? and we re and they wanted to charge us 1,000 1, pounds a day no? and then we started to learn very fast <laughs> <laughs> and then we were able to in create, invent ourselves but all our art is done by we are three people, that's it. We have George and Gilma and Yu Yi Gang, who is our assistant from China. Is that's the whole one. I'm not sure whether you guys is here. We should have a big applause for him. Yeah, big applause. <laughs> big applause. Yeah. He also this year won the Best Looking Artist Assistant Award of the Year for the 16th consecutive year. <laughs> and it's quite exciting even yeah. because at that time uh, everybody said, where are your assistants? They could never believe that we are making our pictures ourselves. It's very important in that way that we are that we don't want the pictures to look handmade, but in fact they are very, very handmade. <laughs> and, we, and we don't want the person behind our back, that's it. That's why we have to make them all. And it's a fantastic creativity. We managed to find a, a what call language and how to, what you call, first we have, we take the images, you know, like this summer we took maybe 10, 10 or 20,000 new images for making new pictures. You know? And then we make contact sheets of the new pictures. And then we have a studio full of books of new contact sheets, all in order, like in a, a what I call, like a dictionary, you know? Leaves, people, outside, heads, legs, whatever you want, you know? it's all there. So you open up all this contact sheet, and we go in there, choose, there is a number, a computer number there, and then we go into the black room, where it's like, what you call, like black bag it is inside where we make the pictures ourselves. We do the design first. They are 10, what you call, 10% of the real piece. And that's the most creative part of us. <laughs> we're, we're very excited because it's, we can describe exactly, in practical terms, how the pictures come about. But it doesn't explain the great mystery of creating the pictures, which even we find difficult to explain. Even when we come down to the studio in the morning, and look at the design we created the previous day. We can never recreate exactly how we arrived at that image. It is it's still a great mystery. And I suppose the, the nearest way of describing the creative experience is the, that it is similar in some way to when you are attracted romantically or sexually towards another person, 
and life is suddenly elevated, life is suddenly better and more colourful and more dramatic. And that's the elevated feeling we have when we're in the process of creating a picture. It's and a strange, mysterious experience. And we don't want a lot too much. <laughs> so we never go to the studio with ideas or plans. If we went with ideas or plans, they would be things we know that we already knew. We want to go to the studio to fall into some new truth that we hadn't thought about or felt before. That could almost be a wonderful conclusion. I have a few last questions and then you know, we can open it up uh, to all of you for questions or, or comments. One thing I wanted to ask you is, we've talked a lot about the many amazing works you've, you've realized and of course um, in the exhibition there are so many of your works, we, we all can go and see the exhibition after the talk. We know very little about artists' unrealized projects. Architects always publish them and they ultimately you know, get things built by publishing unrealized works, but we know very little about artists' unrealized projects. Can you tell us about <coughs> one or some of your projects which have not yet been realized? Very few. <laughs> I'm not sure that we have any unrealized ones. You mean the you, you mean the crypt that they that, that's one which we published. Can you tell us about that? Because that's extraordinary. That, that was fantastic. We, we were truly baby artists, very very inexperienced, and very hopeful and very brave and probably quite arrogant. And we proposed a living sculpture for the Tate Gallery, and that would be a Christmas crib or a nativity, I think they're called. Do these small models with the is it Nazareth, the village? Nazareth, with the, they with say the donkey something, yes. and the, the baby Jesus. And we would create a, a life-size one in the foyer of the Tate Gallery with all the animals. We had a farmer friend who would organize that. And um, we, we would stand in as the two main figures. Yeah? Adam and Steve. <laughs> 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 our dealer would call pressing, no? because there were no uh, same-sex couples at that time, <laughs> and then we're now. Um, yeah, that's what you're joking always says, that pressing, you are pressing, pressing, yeah. pressing, the artist as being pressing. Now, one, one other thing I think is interesting, and it's sort of, I was thinking about it this afternoon, looking at the show, is memory is important, and we live in an age where we have more and more information, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have more memory. It might be that amnesia is somewhere at the core you know, of this digital age. And I think artists also bring us back to memory. And I think in the exhibition, there are many aspects of memory. And one thing which is particularly important is the memory of David Robiliard. I wanted us to somehow remember you know, the amazing poet that artist who, whose book was actually an amazing encounter for me when I was thinking for the first time. Yes. Can you tell us about, we should, because yeah. I think we should talk in Stockholm about Robiliard and remember. Just a, a, a brief memory, because it all started when we used to go as in the 70s to a wonderful club in Great Queen Street. It was wonderful to get into a taxi, so take us to Great Queen Street. Mm -hmm. And the, the club was called The Blitz. And it was a strange establishment. It was designed by some young people to appeal to middle-aged management class men <coughs> who'd had war experience or national service. So the whole club was done up to look, look like water. The air raid siren went off every hour. So the, the house wine was called Churchill's Choice. There, there were war posters all over the walls and uh, gas masks hanging up and things. And of course, nobody of that class would ever dream of going to the place. It was a, a total failure. And then one evening, a young couple called Biddy and, and Eve, Eve. Yes. they came in and started to play the piano, but not playing war songs, but just playing nice modern things. And it took off and it became the sort of pre-punk, crypto-crazy nightclub of great international fame. It was extraordinary. And we were there one evening, and a very, very glamorous, tall, blonde, beautiful young man uh, had just joined the team as a, as a waiter, and he came to our table and said, I'm, I'm so shy and embarrassed because I'm studying you at college, and, it, and now I see you in the real light. May I present you with a bottle of Cote de Rome? And he put the bottle down and left, but he didn't open the bottle, so he couldn't even... <laughs> and that, and that, that was Andrew Hurd, who, who, who died some years ago as well, and he introduced to a friend of his, 
he was called Dave Rubilliard. He was a poet who became a painter from Guernsey. And he was, the two of them, we thought, we thought that we had lifetime friends. It never occurred to us that something would happen to, to change that. And uh, like we said, if we were told everything's going to get better, it did. And then, and then HIV and AIDS came along. And so we lost David and yes. But he had a meeting following all over the world still. David Robilia. The nice. poetry and the painting are, there is a small show at the moment in New York. We are amazed at what you call, they are so, every young person is so excited by the, what you call, acid, well, down to earth, but rigid and yeah, poetry. He, he That's a, amazing. He has a following forever. If you look at the work now, and you know, super interesting, the Madonna, they just published his book, his Ete Latinanswad, and Ete talks about this bridge between poetry and art, which of course uh, is so present in Robiliard's work. So urgent to look at David Robiliard. Now, another last question I wanted to ask you. There are many young artists here, and you know, Rainer Maria Rilke wrote this lovely little book, which is an advice to a, a young poet. I was wondering what would in 2019 be your advice to a young artist? Oh, I think that's very simple because we've always given the same advice in that situation. We say, we would say that to a young artist and we say it to ourselves and anyone who wants to create something. We say, tomorrow morning when you wake up, sit on the edge of the bed, keep your eyes closed and don't go about your daily work until you've decided, what do I want to say to the world today? First, and then think. And the second piece of advice to the young art student is Fuck the teachers. <laughs> Give her a charge, thank you so much. Loudly, I'm sure we can hear. <laughs> so maybe, maybe nobody has a question. <laughs> <laughs> no questions? Daniel? artists in that way. We've always wanted to be conventional. We never wanted to be the artist the mother would be ashamed of. It didn't, didn't work out exactly like that. But, <laughs> but uh, our, our works, like, we wanted to be like the artists in the national galleries of the world. And they're always unique. Yeah? But in, well, not only that, because they are so complex to make, that to make a second one would be very difficult. So they, why, that's why they are all unique because they are very labored, they are very in every little thing. It's not an image. It's there are many, many, maybe the new ones have maybe like 50 or 10 or 20, 30, 40, 50 images. So it's all complex. It's hard enough to sell one without trying to sell it more. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have more questions? Yeah, we've got a question here. If we can have a speak microphone. up, I'm sure we can hear you. I'd be happy if you speak the, mic, the microphone because the mic like is on its way. It's better, for, it's better for the recording, indeed. You were very defined about the taboos, social taboos. Uh, do you call yourself a political artist as well, with your attitudes uh, trying to? go against the taboos in the society? Well, I, I, we, we don't say we're political artists. We say that culture in a free society where you have a vote is 
culture is in advance of politics. A, a simple example is the government never changed the rules on child labour, and they would never have done that except for Dickens writing a book about it to put people to shame, and then the people in the population began to realise it was a bad thing, and then they make the government. The government would never have a change to legislation. Culture first, politics after. And life goes for a while. He changed everything, change but world. he had to die for it. But he changed everything, and so that's what we believe. Artists are above that because we are moralists in some way. So people might say that we're politically incorrect. They may be right, but we think we're correct politically. <laughs> more questions? There's a question here. Hey, thank you for a, a nice Q&A. Um, it was when you talked about uh, the 5,000 editions that you sold. Uh, that came sort of uh, right after speaking about... Uh, Posters. Posters. Yeah. Did I say posters or editions? Oh, yeah. Please. 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 Um, no, I was wondering how that, in in terms of, you seem to have this view that about making it available day and night. Uh, so we call it uh, democratic. Um, yes, democratic art. Yes. Um, but the, the the idea of the notion of selling five thousand posters. How is that? They were only ten pounds each, and they are signed by us every single one. Mm. So, I was so sort of him trying to get to the motivation behind it. Is it about making it available to credit? It, it, it means that kids who would never... 99% of the people who admire our pictures or visual exhibitions have no idea that the pictures are for sale or what price they are. They, they f follow it as art. Yeah. So and the whole idea to places. sell all these posters to young people that are, cannot afford anything else, or even like the catalogs, they are very cheap. That's for us is a revolution. We always tell the galleries to sell the catalogue yeah. to the same price as they paid the printer for it. Because we are doing all the, all the design, it's all done free by us. So the galleries only have to pay for the printer. And we sign them all to make them easier to sell. Also, also in answer to this question, I think it's interesting, you know, we once did together this uh, publication, you know, with INSB. And, and, and you know the idea was to do an artist newspaper on poster in an edition of two hundred thousand, one two hundred thousand copies, and give it away, you know, for free all over the world. And it leads, of course, that art can pop up in different circuits. So then, a few years later, after your issue was published, I was in Japan, you know, in a hotel room, and I switched on the TV. And there was a strange film, you know, it was in Japanese, there was no translation, I didn't understand the word. But, you know, as a decor in the room where, of the film, there was your point of on the wall. Fantastic. So that's how I can travel unexpectedly, no? Fantastic. More questions? Uh, I wonder, here, in the uh, here? here. Uh, thank you for coming here. I wonder, uh, has it been uh, positive or negative for you for being a, uh, a gay couple doing this kind of things? Uh, um, I'm gay myself. Do you think it's been? Uh, we, we we personally never used the term gay or since same since, sex we, since we since we discovered that the the, the, the it was the gay it, was, it was used for for female prostitutes. They were the gay ladies, yeah. <laughs> so and we didn't believe in gay sex or straight sex or gay people. So we think everyone is sexual, the same as plants are plants and trees are trees and the animal kingdom is animal kingdom. We don't we don't have to. We don't know exactly, exactly, exactly where we are, but we could be anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we always say that, that we, we must be right, because you, you hear somebody in a bar who say, I feel horny tonight, it's quite a common thing. Or if say, you never hear somebody say, I say, I feel hetero horny tonight. <laughs> never. Or I feel hetero horny. Never would say that. Right? You're just horny. <laughs> Thanks. Question. And that's just, just the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Got a question here in the second row in the middle. If you can have the microphone, please. Thank you so much, Gilbert George. Um, I have a question about the titles um, of the series of works you make. And uh, uh, what comes first? So the, the work comes first and then you come up with a title or you come up with this... Um, iconic phrase or... That's, that's quite, a, quite a mystery in a way. We're never sure what we're doing. No, we, we don't believe that somebody knows how to do something is very good at doing it. 
We think all of the great novels are written by novels who didn't really know how to write it. They, 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 they're just able to do it in that way. So sometimes the title is there, but not known to us before the pictures. Maybe it emerges during or after. It's all a, all a great mystery. But the title makes itself in the end. That's it. We it's, know it. It's got to have a... Just we don't know where we go when we make pictures, because we could go anywhere. No? But in the end, when we have the, the old pictures are finished, no? we know the title. <laughs> We just begin, we've just begun to make a new group of pictures, which we're very excited by. Yes. We can't tell you the title, because that hasn't emerged yet. <laughs> Although maybe it has, and we're not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll give you two clues, because we'll give you two of the titles, which point a little to the direction the pictures are taking. One is called Darwin Day, which of course doesn't exist until now. And the other is called Bedwetting. <laughs> And the other one is called Full Fig. Full Fig. And another one is called Date Rape. Does anyone know the date of Date Rape? When did that come into existence first? In print or in court? 1983. 1983, very interesting. We found other ways of saying it without that before that. No, we're, fast, we're, walk, we're going down this road with the pictures and we're looking straight ahead without thinking, without feeling, without hearing. And of course, you, you don't feel what's underfoot then, yeah? But so, there, so whether there are yeah. chippings or big rocks or small rocks, we don't know. We're going down that dodgy road. But there are feeling, it feels like we are walking into a magic land in some way. Where every day flowers are very big, people are very small. Alice in Wonderland in some way. Very acid, very what you call magical in some way. We like it when our young friends look at the designs and say, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> or, or they pay us the ultimate compliment when people a third of our age say, you guys are crazy. We love, we love that. Thank you so much, Gilbert and George. I wanted to ask you about the video works. You made a series of video works in the early 70s. How did they come about and have you ever thought about making more? That was the, that, that was, came about because of the late Gary Shum, who ran the video gallery in, in Dusseldorf. In fact, it was a, a, a little bit fake, because you couldn't make video like he wanted to make it. So he, he did it as film, and then it was transferred to video. But it was supposed to be a video gallery. And we did one first, called The Nature of Our Looking, which was all about us, us. in the nature. We've, before we were told to fuck off as own cunts. <laughs> and, and then we entered the modern urban world and we did three uh, uh, triptych of videos. One was called In the Bush. The Portrait of a Young Man. Portrait, Portrait of the young, artist, young. the artist, a young man. And uh, Gordon Makes Us Drunk, that was another one. Gordon's Makes Us Drunk was very exciting because the moment it was released, our gallery received a telephone call from Gordon's Gin to say that we're very excited that young, trendy artists were doing something to do with Gordon's Gin because the average age of the consumers of Gordon's Gin was getting quite old and they, they wanted to start introducing Gordon's Gin to a younger audience and they thought trendy young artists were <laughs> So I told the, told the gallery to say that they didn't bother us yes? and then they called back again and they sent flowers and they sent someone around, they were very, very keen very keen to involve themselves in modern, modern, trendy artists and Gordon's gin. So they, they made so many advances to us and to the gallery that in the end I said to the dealer, just send him a copy of the tape around. So we copied the tape, sent around to them. We didn't hear a word after that. <laughs> There's also the world, the, the, most, the, the best, mo the, uh, world the, wor the, the world of Gilbert and George. 81, because that's 81. everything. That yeah, is everything. Shown. That is designed by us. It's 90 minute film, and it's like that total cosmology of ourselves from the beginning to the end. And here we have the first time interviews by ordinary people. We went out in the street and took them in and, talk, and asked them about their life. Uh, is it worth living and all the stuff? They, made, they gave these amazing responses. It's just so tragic and at the same time so beautiful. 
That's the best film we ever did. And we just digitalized it this year and uh, improved the color in some parts. And it's extraordinary. And that started when you, you met in Greece, a teenager. Oh, yeah, we met a young American yeah. boy who followed us or became. He said he wanted to become a movie director. Movie director, and then he said he would like to make a film with us, but he wanted to know what we would, what would the film be, what would it be about? And we said we wanted to be about everything we could think about, feel about. Hopefully, we would not leave anything out. We would try to be entirely inclusive, to make it jam full of everything. And it's it's a movie that does stand the test of time. It's a very very beautiful movie, but in general, it's very difficult as artists to make videos because you have to invite people and they don't, you know, pictures on the wall are so simple and so... so it, it I mean, videos functions. take up a whole room. Yeah. Yeah. It's very difficult, yeah, because you cannot have 10 videos in one room because the noise would be impossible. You cannot follow it, so you have to have one only. It takes up too many rooms, so our, even if we've got our language, our big format, or the rectangle or square, are so simple and so direct in your face. Hmm? That's it. And, That's I think that is, and that is the absolutely perfect transition, I think, now for all of us to go and see the pictures on the wall. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much.